One, good two, morning. Three. <laughs> good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to the ATIPI Tech Talks, which is something really exciting because there was some void left behind with the demise of uh, Tibo Berlin Type Talks and other uh, events. And it's good that we have something that we can uh, replace it with something valuable. Uh, I'm Eve Peters. Um, and next to me at your side, oh, this is weird because it's all. <laughs> It's Nika Hi, Nika. Hello, yeah. Everyone, welcome to ATI Pi Talk 2021. We all are excited for the event. So it's going to be three days and we'll be talking, we'll be having amazing 40 type experts from all over the world. So we are so excited to hear from them. And of course, we'll be talking about education, technology, business, and everything that is related with type. And I'm sure most of you are aware of it, but still, because we are live on Facebook, um, people might be wondering what is A type I take uh, Tech Talk 2021. So it was supposed to be like a physical program, but because of COVID-19, we all are at our home, but still we are connecting with people from all around the world. And the best part is we have 128 participants who are joining with, the, with us right now, right? Yeah, and the great thing about we we miss not being with you in person, but uh, yeah. this online events give us the opportunity for many more people to join us. So we don't have the financial nor the geographical restrictions. So this is really great that we can all be together in this virtual space and share this experience. This experience is being recorded. Uh, th this means that all the talks will remain available for participants. Uh, during the conference and, and the weeks beyond. Uh, they will not be available immediately, but it takes like three to 24 hours for the videos to, to pop up. And also, uh, of course, thanks to the continued and much valued support of Google, uh, eventually uh, talks, I don't know if all of them, but most of them will also end up on our YouTube channel. So you will be able to enjoy them even long after this conference. Yeah, exactly. So if um, we'll be starting our presentation in a while, and if there is any questions, the participant can also write down their question in Q&A box so that it will be easier to filter out the questions. And we'll also read it out uh, when the question answer round starts. So we have amazing presenter, and because of which a lot of participants are excited. I'm sure the participants must be eager, like when these guys are going to start the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so without any further ado, we would like to introduce our presenter and he is Jason. So Jason uh, will be, uh, Jason Pamantel will be presenting and the title itself is very interesting. So I would like to give a brief information about Jason. Jason has been designing and also building for the wave since 1994. I was just one year old. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for pointing that out. Now we're old. So he has also specialized in web typography for the last 10 years and one of the leading experts in using uh, variable fonts. He consulted with new nearly every major wave and all web browser oh, company. And Shanita. also, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're there. Good. Oh, I, yeah. I can still hear. <laughs> <laughs> He's also uh, the invited expert uh, to the Wavefront Working Group at W3C. Thanks, yeah, <laughs> this <laughs> has been designing typography system used by millions of people every day for entertainment and government alike. So Jason has also published taught workshops and explored multiple aspects of typography in global platform. And he also serves as secretary for a type I board. We have this in Pamental. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you both Eve and Sunita for being such great hosts and, um, and, and just being familiar faces that I get to look at kind of off to the side over here. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, and and yes, I did celebrate my 50th birthday a couple weeks ago. So um, yes, the, the gray hair, all of that <laughs> stuff um, kind of goes with the territory. Uh, so I'm I'm incredibly um, 
incredibly honored to be opening up the the event this year. There are going to be so many incredible talks, and um, I do uh, I, I do want to make reference to um, there's going to be some just absolute giants in uh, in the creation of variable fonts and the genesis of this whole. Um, format. It's something that I've been a huge believer in since the day that I saw it launched in Warsaw in 2016. And um, and and so variable fonts are a part of what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, but but variable fonts, typography on the web, um, the advanced text layout stuff that Elka and, and others are going to be talking about later on that's becoming available in CSS are all the things that got me thinking about not just how do you make nicely typeset web pages, but as our reading experiences start to shift more and more onto screens, how could we not lose the wonderful uh, care with which books, good books are typeset? And and so this has been something that's been on my mind for a long time. And, um, and thanks to a little bit of a prompt from John Barry a couple of years ago, we started working on a project together that led very directly to uh, to doing something like this, where um, the whole point of this is not, um, not not because Moby Dick is the best book in the world, but um, but there's no copyright on it anymore, so I can actually use the whole thing on here and, and keep it open source and and talk about the framework and really explore what is a book, um, what what makes something bookish, what makes it uh, what makes it so wonderful, and it's not just the feel or the smell, although um, this has a wonderful feel and a wonderful smell, um, but uh, but it, it's it is all the little touches, all the little nuances about the typesetting, um, about the proportion, about the way that you can take it in um, a page at a time, and I, I do think that that uh, there's something to that. Um, so um, so what I want to show you is is my attempt at. Uh, to try and find a way to bring that bookishness to something that is delivered in the web. And everything that you're going to see today is actually shown live in Firefox. Um, so it's all in the web browser um, and and an iOS simulator. Those two things that I'm going to be showing you. And, um, and, and all of these things are also available online. Um, so at the end of the presentation, I have a link to a page on Noticed that has these slides embedded and has a ton of resources to everything I've been doing to document this whole process. So um, I have a, a newsletter that has been dormant for a little bit, but I, I will be picking that up again shortly, I, I hope, um, where I've been documenting a lot of things about web typography. But in particular, um, there are, are seven articles so far in um, in and around this project itself. Um, so uh, what are the things that make something um, a, a book? I, you know, it's it's not just that everything is bound, but uh, there's things about uh, about legibility and readability and, and how much you can take something with you and the refinements that we add to it. Um, but there's also, uh, there's also something portable. Um, you can take a book with you um, but you can take more books with you on an iPad uh, or a phone. There, there's the ability to have it uh, more shareable in that you can tell somebody that you're reading this book and this chapter was interesting uh, and you can stick a bookmark in it, but those things don't always travel so well. So this edition of Moby Dick is different than the other couple I have on the shelf that's different from many others. So when I say I'm on page 47, that's not the same. Um, nor is it the same when I say I'm at 37% on the Kindle um, and then in iBooks it's something else. Uh, and that and those that numbering changes on every screen. So there's a bunch of things about the book that doesn't translate well uh, to a modern experience that uh, and and only on digital devices do we have that capability. So so let's let's start to explore this a little bit. Now the first thing that uh, comes to mind in in a reading experience is it has to be legible. Um, and uh, so in exploring that, um, I've used Literata three, which I think is an absolutely wonderful text face and it has a, a great weight and optical size axis. It's from Type Together, and 
In thinking about legibility, we want to think about scale um, and, and also take advantage of an optical size axis so that we can make something a little more refined when it's at a larger size, uh, but keep it really sturdy and easy to read. So we wouldn't want to do that same kind of uh, tweak to the variable uh, axis for optical size on, on paragraph text that becomes harder to read. So we keep that appropriate uh, to the scale of the text. Now, we also want to make sure that it is readable. So there's legibility, there's readability. Uh, and, and also, um, a, a little aside here, Bruno Mog has actually gotten uh, involved in another organization since departing from uh, Dalton Mog, and uh, they're publishing incredible articles on on a lot of uh, these topics about legibility and readability in, in type and typography. Uh, so, so definitely check that out. Now, one of the things about readability is making sure line length isn't too long. So, so there are lots of things about doing this in print. There are things that we can do online as well to set a maximum line length. And there's various different ways that you can do that. Um, the specifics of it don't really make that much difference right now. Just knowing that we can say, um, don't have it be roughly more than this many characters or this proportion to the size of the text. So it's not exactly a character count, but we know we can get it pretty close. We also know that we wanna make sure that our line height or letting is uh, about proportional to the length of the line of the text. So on a shorter or smaller screen, shorter lines, you could be a little bit tighter set with it, but on, on a large screen, you wanna make sure it doesn't get overly long. Uh, now, when we add thing, add more paragraphs, we want to make sure we can differentiate. Now for general purpose on the web, often we space the paragraphs apart because people tend to scan the reading a lot more, but when it's a long form reading, we might want to indent instead to preserve that linear flow and that vertical rhythm, uh, but we probably don't want to do that with the first pair, first line. So um, just using basics of CSS, we're able to create a nice indent as we uh, as we follow down without impacting the first line. We can still target that with CSS so that the first one stays as it is. Now, there are a lot of other refinements that we want to be able to add. And that's where we really start to get uh, into what are the things that are so wonderful about a well typeset book. We can't do all of those things on the web, but we can do a lot. So if we wanted to emphasize that first line, we certainly can. Um, and then it's obviously a, a, a stylistic question, but if we wanted to have that nice initial capital, we can do that too. And these are all things that are really well supported and you can do uh, and have it work in every browser that's out there these days. <clears throat> Excuse me. So. What are some of the other things we do? We tailor it for the screen size. We want to make sure that not only does this work well on a large screen, but also on a small one. So we can use things in CSS that allow the text to scale from one screen size to another. So our headings don't have to be quite so big on a small screen on a phone, where they can be a little smaller than they would be on our desktop screen, but still preserve the hierarchy that we need uh, as as we go along. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. We also run into an issue when the lights go out. Looking at a screen like this is not necessarily optimal. Um, having that bright white screen beaming at you when you're trying to read at night. Um, we've also just jumped into territory where the printed book doesn't do so well. Um, without having an external light source, you don't get anything like this. But modern phones and desktop operating systems actually allow us to do something to make a more appropriate reading experience for the environment in which you're in, which is dark mode. And one of the things that we can do with a variable font is when we do invert the contrast, we can lighten the weight ever so slightly. So that way the you don't have that sort of ink gain or pixel gain when you have a light text on a dark background. And, and these are all things that, um, designers and, and typographers learn over time um, and and my role here is to just let you know that we can do these things on the web too um, there's an awful lot of what you're able to do when typesetting or designing something in print that there actually are really wonderful analogs for that and i, I know e even more precision is coming 
uh, from the W3C combining open type and uh, features and, and font metrics and better CSS technology. And, and that's coming up at four o'clock today. Um, so that's gonna be a really interesting one too. So, um, so we're now getting past a little bit of, of what printed books can do because now we can create a nice reading experience when it's light or dark out. Um, if we have light sensitivity, then we can invert that contrast as well. So we're now starting to put some control in the hands of the user to appreciate and consume this, uh, this content, they read this book in more and more scenarios. Now, the lights come back on again and everything can invert. And this can also be expressed as a preference. So either it can be set with your phone is in dark mode, it automatically switches, or you can actually give somebody the preference to set it one way or the other. And I think that's really important. Um, when we think about accessibility and we think about everybody's uh, unique story coming to reading something, um, we want to allow that experience to flex a little bit and adapt to that person's needs. Now, what you're seeing here is actually an embedding of this project from the web at mobydick.wales. Um, and again, there will be a link um, at the end of this that will help um, bring, bring you along. Um, so, so don't worry about needing to keep track of this stuff right now. Um, you can see we've, so I'm gonna back up just a little bit here. Um, so uh, we, we've drifted into the realm of the personal. Um, now we want to not only be able to show all of those things that I was showing you about light and dark mode, um, but we also want to be able to experience this in a way that is appropriate for us. And so now what I'm doing is I'm actually interacting with this live and I'm gonna go under my settings and if I should choose that I would like to experience this in a different way, I can actually enable this interface. And now I can actually do this. And so I'm just swiping on my trackpad and it snaps really nicely. And I can look at this on any size device and enjoy it however I see fit. So I can look at it on a large screen. Or if we look at it on a small one, let me back up again here and then pull this up in the iOS simulator. And if we go here, And I'll just pick a chapter. And I can do the same thing on the phone. And this whole thing is responsive. So I can actually let it reflow and look at this on any size device and get that same smooth scrolling experience if I prefer to read it in that way. And, and for me, I like that chunk of content. Um, and you'll also notice in terms of um, the refinements here, being able to do things like turn hyphenation on and off based on screen size or language, if you choose, um, and, and be able to, like again, get these small refinements based on how big or how small the screen is, uh, really makes a big difference. And then now I can go right back. So it's, it's the same web page and it's the same load, but I can, with one tap, change that entire experience. So coming back here, um, we get to one of these other questions um, about that book experience about sharing that I mentioned. And, and I think that that's, that's really important. And I had mentioned to you earlier that conundrum about different digital devices, different editions of a book, um, different size screens, creating a way uh, or this, this impossibility of telling somebody else, where are you in this book? Well, I'm in chapter one and I'm reading a bit more. You'll notice that there's something along the side of the screen here. And I've just used CSS to enumerate paragraphs. So I haven't had to do any custom coding to this, but I'm able to look at this. And what I'm doing with a little bit of JavaScript is 
every time this gets into screen here, I'm updating this link. And I click copy on that, and I'm gonna make a new window and paste this in. And what will happen is I will end up at exactly the same spot. I've gone in a different browser. I could have emailed this to somebody, it doesn't really matter, but there's a bookmark there at that paragraph on that chapter. So I now have a way to share this location with anybody else on any size screen in any device and actually be able to share with them the exact spot in the book. So it's chapter and verse. I mean, that actually is a pretty portable way of doing this, um, but we have the technology to do that on the web pretty easily. Um, so the other thing that's sort of still in the works while I'm, I'm kind of uh, iterating on this project is the ability to actually build a list of bookmarks. So that's not really doing much of anything at the moment, but um, that's what's coming. That's kind of the next thing that, that I'm working on. Um, but while we're here, I thought it'd be nice to show, you know, we can add nice typographic end marks. Um, and if you look at these pages, you'll notice that not a single one of these paragraphs ends up with one word on the last line. And the reason that we have that is because there's a, a wonderful little JavaScript plugin that I got from Nathan Ford um, uh, called Widow Adjust. And what's actually happening is it is going through when I load the page and it is adding padding on the right hand side of every paragraph to ensure that I have a minimum number of characters that I've defined on that last line and, and then it'll go to the, the word break behind that. So um, it's just leaning into what the browser is going to do to wrap the text and adding a little bit of padding to ensure that I don't end up with kind of an unsightly little typographic gaff at the end of any paragraph. Um, so there's all kinds of little things that are combinations of just standard CSS in addition to um, these, these other uh, little tidbits that we can add with a little bit of JavaScript here and there. Um, so this is still a little bit of a work in progress, but I think that this has come a really long way. Uh, it works really well with um, any kind of text you might throw in with images. And because it's in a web browser, if I want to do another book on web typography and have editable code samples in there, they can be embedded in here too. And thanks to a lot of the things I learned from Rachel Andrew about fragmentation and how to do these things with CSS columns. So that's really what's happening when we go under settings here and we enable the swipe UI. We're using CSS columns to enable what's going on here. And let me go back to the slides. Come on. I've totally lost my slides now. Hang on a second. Come on. Now it's not letting me get out of here at all. Oh, there has to, it's always something, right? So let's let's see if we can actually find where my slides went. There we go. Okay. So um so we've done a lot of things here. Um uh, we've made things shareable, we've made it personal. Um we're uh, oh that's right i wanted to just show you um this the use of the css columns as we go across here um which is what allows us to tie into don't break inside this or that um and in browsers that actually support it controlling widows and orphans at the beginning and ending of a column um, which actually works pretty nicely in safari uh, it just hasn't been implemented in other browsers yet but the css support is there now um, the last thing that would be of a concern is it's really easy to throw a book in your bag. Um, it's not so easy to take a website unless that website has been created as a progressive web app. And that's the last bit that I wanted to show you, which I've implemented in another project, is to ensure that these things can be taken with you. So um, so about a year ago, there was, uh, there was a lot of things going on, but, but one of those things was the murder of George Floyd. And, and in the inter intervening time, thankfully, his murderer has been convicted. And I'm pretty happy about that. But uh, what's more important is, at least uh, to me, is, is a, a greater level of awareness um, of a lot of issues that uh, people are struggling with all around the world, but in the U.S. in particular, 
um, it's a real problem. And so I had gotten to thinking about um, trying to learn a bit more. I mean, I'm a, a white male, so I already have a position of privilege, but I've been trying to learn. Um, and one of the things I wanted to do was read more of what Dr. Martin Luther King had written. And so I went looking for a PDF or some way to read this letter and I couldn't really find anything that I, I really appreciated or really liked or responded to. And uh, and so I decided to create something and then make it open source and put it out for, for people to see and and then use a lot of this same uh, these same ideas. So um, I'm going to make sure that this has loaded everything the way it should. There we go. Um, it's a lot of the same um, typographic work, um, but I wanted to ensure that um, the whole text is here that um, it's it's out there. Uh, it's not going to go away. Um, it's at letterfromjail.com. And, and that's that's something that um, hopefully I'll be able to give over to somebody who's a, a, a worthier keeper than I. But um, the thing that I wanted to show you is not only does this work well, and if you want to you know, take the book with you, is that this is also something that I've created as a progressive web app. So the moment that you go to that site, you have the ability to install it on your home screen on uh, in Chrome on the desktop or uh, on the on iOS or Android. And you now actually have that whole thing downloaded and saved in your, uh, in your, in your browser. Um, and even if you're offline, all of these things are available and you can do the same thing with a whole book. Um, there are obviously limits to what can be stored in the cache, but this format actually works really quite well to allow you then do all of these things offline. So now when you take that book with you on the plane, you actually can have the whole thing with you just like you would with any other kind of book format. So I'm really hoping that this is something that uh, maybe we could convince some publishers to to think about and think about ways to um, to manage books this way. It could still come from a content management system. You could still create gates to the access to it if you wanted, but um, but I just think this is a nicer, better way. Um, I, currently the ebook formats just don't support this level of, of typographic work. Uh, it's, it's just not there, um, but it is in the browser. And that's what I think is so wonderful about this. So um, I'm gonna come back over here and I know we're, um, we're getting past the half hour mark and we wanna make sure there's plenty of time for questions. And so I'm gonna go here. And just to kind of sum things up, we've made sure it's legible, we've made sure it's readable. Um, we've made sure we capture some of those refinements in finer typography to uh, sort of elevate that experience and uh, make it that much smoother for people. But we've gone further than that and we've, we've made it something that is portable and shareable um, you can take it with you. You can tweak it to tailor it and, and get it to be um, more what you need as a reader. Uh, and, and all of these things could really work with any kind of text. So we've looked at a couple different things and, uh, and th these, these sorts of refinements to the type and typography uh, really make a meaningful difference to people for, uh, for those with dyslexia or other kind of cognitive issues being able to change the spacing um, I, that was actually a wonderful talk from Kevin Larson at A Type I in Montreal a few years ago. Uh, it was a real eye opener for me, and that direct, directly led to um, building in some of those preferences. And I've I've had a lot of really great feedback from people with dyslexia and who suffer from crowding. One one person didn't know that they did suffer from crowding, um, and as soon as she saw my talk. And and saw the let the the word space out like that. It was an eye opening thing to her, and and that was really uh, humbling to to speak with her after the fact. And she said, you know, all of a sudden I could actually read what you had on the screen, and that was that was really um, something that she had no idea uh, like why she struggled with reading. And that was um, that was a, such a simple thing. So so I've actually gone on to build this into. The design system for all the the new sites that are being created for the state of Rhode Island here in the U.S. and it's a project that I'm working on now, and um, so that actually when you go to COVID.ri.gov and take a look at what's here, 
under settings and language. They also support multiple languages, but all of these controls are here and you can adjust this however you need. Um, and we've had tons of really good feedback from this. Um, it's all just built into the CSS. Uh, it works everywhere. And, and we're really excited to bring this, uh, all these extra touches for accessibility um, and, and understanding for a much broader population. So with that, thank you very much. Well, I hope we have time Thank for you, questions. Jason. Thank you, Jason. Okay, so um, we have got uh, quite a few questions in, in, in the back. First of all, it's great not only to look at uh, the readability, but also the extra efforts for uh, people with reading disabilities. It's a, it's a pretty pretty neat, uh, the work that you do. So it's, it's really commendable. Um, Sunita, you're on mute. Yeah, <laughs> I was listening to both of you. It was an amazing presentation and uh, a lot of people can actually relate to it. Thank you so much, Jason. And I guess we'll be taking the questions. There are a lot of questions um, our participants are also writing down. So still, if you have any question, you can write down in Q&A box. So we'll be reading out the first question that we have copied from the chat, okay? So it's from Gunnar Betersman. So the question is, are job caps well supported? So, um, so Gunnar, good to see you virtually anyway. Um, I, yes, um, this way of doing it works everywhere. Um, so this is targeting, this CSS targets the first letter of the first paragraph and, and styles. So there's are pseudo selectors that are really well supported. Um, this works in, in every browser even going back several versions of IE. Um, it's just floating that character and then adding a, a few tweaks to even out the layout implementation across different browsers. Um, so that's actually covered in my newsletter pretty thoroughly. Now there's initial letter, uh, which is unfortunately only supported in Safari right now, which is a much better way of doing things. Um, so hopefully if we all bug the people from the different browser teams that are here this week, um, maybe we can drum up some more support for, for better implementation on that. Um, but this technique um, works everywhere and, and is pretty good. Um, it's not perfect, but it, it does work pretty reliably. There's a question by Tamir Hassan who asks about fallback fonts. How does it deal with fallback fonts? So um, I actually, th that's, that was the very first thing that I wrote about for the fonts.com blog over 10 years ago. And, and it's the same technique still works today. So using some kind of font loader, at the time it was an earlier version. These days I use font face observer from, uh, from Bram Stein. And uh, there, there are some rumblings of trying to build more of this into CSS proper, uh, but it's not there yet. So you do need an extra library to put a class into the page, uh, usually in the HTML element, to tell you whether or not the web fonts have loaded. And if they haven't loaded, you can actually reference some CSS that doesn't call the web fonts. And that also helps get text on screen faster, which is really important if you're concerned with um, overall web performance metrics, particularly with the latest emphasis on core web vitals. Uh, you want to use font display swap and, and make sure it triggers the fallback fonts right away and, and you can render the text uh, and it works really well. Um, so the stack for the book actually tailors this for um, static fonts. So the, the, the fallback to static web fonts to variable fonts. So it actually will tailor it all, all the way along. Um, and the variable fonts will work everywhere but IE. Um, so all modern browsers, all the, the major phone operating systems, I think there are still a couple of browsers like Baidu that may not support variable fonts, but I honestly haven't checked lately, um, but, but support is generally quite good. Okay, so the next question is by Nupur Datya, and the question is, how many languages does it support and does it support Indian language? So there's actually nothing about 
this project that is necessarily language specific. So you really could do this um, left to right, right to left. Uh, you could use different um, different scripts. I don't know enough about typography outside my own language, unfortunately. Um, I, I only speak English. It makes me feel really dumb when I'm at a type I conferences around the world and I hear people chattering away in like two and three and four languages. Um, however, uh, all of these techniques could be used with different writing systems, uh, different writing directions there. It's all fairly straightforward CSS. There might be a couple of things that I focus on that are more particular to uh, Western language typographic styles, um, styling the first line. I don't know if that's something people do in other languages. I, I have to be honest there. Um, but I think that you you could, and I would certainly love to see that. There is an interesting question from Siva Kalyan, and that's something that also, it's something sometimes confusing. So Siva asks, did I understand correctly that you need to make the text lighter when it's displayed on a dark background? I've seen inconsistent advice on this. Um, I have as well. And I started out feeling like I probably wanted to go in the other direction. Um, I received a number of stern talkings to from a few people when I first started talking about it. And um, and I think they know better than I. And, and the more I've dug into it, um, I, I, I do agree, although the higher the quality of the screen, I think the less issue it tends to be. Um, with a lower quality screen, particularly if you think back to like a, like an actual picture tube screen, when you have light text on a dark background, it tends to bleed out a little bit. And um, and so actually, if you've been following some of the great articles that have been written lately about ink traps and light traps, like uh, Toshi Omagari had a really great investigation of that recently. Um, when you think about how this is put on a screen, um, what tends to happen is the light stuff will expand and the dark stuff will contract a little bit. So So that's why typically, um, you might think to lighten the weight just a hair and potentially even increase the letter spacing just a hair. And, and that will separate those letter forms and avoid um, some of that kind of bleeding together. Okay, so moving to the next question. And the next question is, from Patham and the question is, does the PWA contain the font as well? So the progressive web app will cache any assets that are loaded. So whether it's fonts, JavaScript, I mean, and now, now that's, that is predicated upon my self-hosting that font. So all of the thing, all of the demos and things that I do I tend to stick to using open source typefaces for that very reason. So that is that is uh, that is an issue. You need to make sure that uh, for your particular use case that you have the right license to self-host the font. Um, and and I would imagine that you probably should talk to whoever you have licensed it from because sometimes they will have a different license for an application. This is somewhere in the middle. So it is a bit of a gray area. I think this is kind of a licensing conundrum, but um, but it's real, it's all within the browser. So in my opinion, it's something that should be treated as a web use. Um, but I, I didn't make the typefaces and I didn't make the licenses. So um, I want to be respectful of other people's preferences about that. John Berry wants to know how the adding padding works. So that was a really, and so I, I'm assuming that he's talking about padding on the right hand edge of the paragraphs or, that's or the widow out thing, yeah. widows. Yes, yes. Um, so uh, I used to use a module in Drupal that would very simply just put a non breaking space between the last two words of a paragraph. Really like simple, simple, simple solution, um, but not elegant. Um, this uh, from Nathan Ford was a really elegant little bit of JavaScript. It's just a little 
file that you load and then you reference it in your JavaScript to trigger it on load and resize of the window to make sure that each line has that minimum number of characters on it. And, um, and, and in my experience so far, even with pretty long chapters of text, it works quite reliably. Um, I know that he has other, uh, he has a more modern library for handling lots of other little typographic tidbits, but this is the one that I wanted. So I, I've tended to just use this one. Um, and, and once you get it set up, it's, it's pretty painless um, it, and, and works pretty reliably. And the next question is by Alexander Haber. And the question is, the question is, if someone would be interested to actually print from the browser, either to paper or a PDF, are there CSS printing system that takes care of suitable piece layout, proper piece marking, margin and keeping line together, preventing headline, headings at the bottom? There's only so much that you can do with a print style sheet. Um, you can get rid of some of those things, but it is generally kind of a mess. Um, the person you want to follow who has done a huge amount of research in that area is Rachel Andrew. Um, she's absolutely brilliant. She's done an incredible amount of work um, in that area specifically. Um, I'm trying to remember, uh, I think Prince, I believe, is the application that she has used um the most in terms of uh getting good quality output using css to create multi-page pdfs out of web stuff um i haven't spent a lot of time with it though um so i i don't know i don't know what a, what a good answer is for that uh there's a question from lawrence penny what would be involved technically and politically in getting Project Gutenberg to use this kind of typography for PG texts rather than their current HTML view? Well, honestly, that was one of the so that was one of the sources where I found um, that letter from jail text. And yes, it's awful. Um, I don't know. I mean, I've made all of my work here open source, so technically, it's if they want to do it they can go do it but um it's certainly something that i'm actively thinking about what publishers i could talk to um and actually there is one that i have spoken with about it briefly um as a way to deliver books especially ones that are tech and design related for the web i think it's kind of a natural fit but um but yeah i i I really would love to see more people think about doing stuff in this way because the browser, I think, is a natural fit to deliver this reading experience. Um, and, and given the fact that so much of this has been technically possible in the EPUB format and yet no one has ever bothered to implement it, let's just ditch it. Let's actually skip that whole production step and just make better websites out of our books. Okay, so the next question is from Boril. And the question is, what are the prospect to use more open type features on Weave? So for an example, capital, superscript, local forms or stylistic set? Um, that's a great question. It's actually something that I do quite a lot. So in the um, on the book site itself, I'm using the open type small caps um feature so that's um that's one i'm also using it for uh controlling the the number of forms and on the rhode island design system we're actually using um uh using open type features to govern number sets that are used there as well so things that are in text are using old style figures and things that are set on their own are in lining figures so uh, you know we actually do make use of that stuff quite a bit um, and and I think I you know I I do kind of lump some of that stuff into you have to make this sort of catalog of all the things that you do as a designer as a typographer 
to think about how do you set type? What are the steps you go through? So I've got my set of preferences and, and they're not yours. They're, you know, I, I want to do drop caps. So I figure out how to do drop caps. Not everybody likes them. So um, you have to think about what are the steps that you take and then realize that most of those things are possible. So all of those stylistic sets, all of those open type features, um, if you have a well-made web font, they will be available. Now, this is one of the challenges that you run into with using things directly on the Google Fonts platform as wonderful as it is and ubiquitous as it is, most of the time you don't get access to the open type features. That may be something we could convince them to do otherwise, but but that's not always going to be the case. And that's why I tend to go with a well-optimized self-hosted font wherever possible. So that way I can get the features that I want out of it um, and make sure that I have those available. I think we have time for one last question and then we will move on. Um, so uh, quickly, what's your preferred approach to footnotes and notes? Oh, that's a great question. You know, that's actually something that um, I started researching a bit more. Um, I think I wrote about that in my newsletter a bit, but I honestly don't remember. I started to, um, actually, there may be at least part of a solution in the book site already. There aren't that many in this edition of the book, but there are some. Um, there's not a ton of standardization on footnote HTML structure, um, but I did find some good references to that and, and started to build that into how I was dealing with this on the web. And one of the things that, again, I think is so nice about making this web related is that they can be tied to the point in the text where they exist. And then you can choose how you want to present it. Do you want to stick them at the end? Do you want to stick them in the margins on the side? I mean, you have a ton of choice as the designer to make use of this space. Uh, if you have a really wide screen, you know, I currently have the book set up to only ever do one column, but it could be two. There's nothing stopping you. Um, but that one column of text on a wider screen gives you plenty of room for figures and footnotes and things in the margins. And um, I tend to want to put things where people can see them. Um, and, and then it's really more of a, a, a design decision to say, um, yeah, yeah, I see Jeffrey's note about John Hicks and whether or not we need footnotes in HTML, but you can do some of these things. And there also is an emerging standard for, um, uh, for web annotation. And that's another thing that um, I think is uh, is really interesting. Um, and so that's that's another area of shareable. Like, I don't know if people, anybody remembers ReadMill as a, an online book platform. One of my favorite things about that was being able to see what other people were highlighting. Medium has something kind of like that now, but having that in book form so that the people that you sort of share follows with um, on the ReadMill platform, you could see the passages that they highlight in a text. And that to me, I think is really fascinating. So embracing these more of these open standards to make that reading experience that much more shareable um, and collaborative and, um, and community. Like, I, I don't know, those are really interesting things to me. And I think that takes books to a place where they are not readily available to people in that kind of setting. Okay, so we're five minutes out to the next talk. Uh, I want to thank uh, Jason for this uh, fascinating and 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 yeah, very like revealing uh, presentation. Uh, thank you for my co-presenter the other way around. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if you want to, this is confusing. If you want to continue the conversation, find us in the hangout room. So yeah. uh, and so if you want to continue this conversation, go to the hangout room. If you want to see the next talk, it will be up in five minutes. <laughs>